Welcome all to today's webinar, the cybersecurity law, data security law and personal information protection law in a nutshell. What you need to know. My name is Marike Seselberg. I'm manager at China for IP Consulting GmbH. And yeah, I want to talk about um, these three laws to you today and um, we will give you a short overview um, which parts of these laws are relevant for you and which might not be at the time being. And one short information um, beforehand, um, you can see here we have China Brand News, our newsletter, and you can, um, via our website, register for it to get regular updates on either in, uh, intellectual property news or cybersecurity and data protection in China. So let's jump right in. Um, I want to keep this webinar short, so it will roughly be 20 to 25 minutes. To understand what is important for you um, talking about these three laws, cybersecurity law, data security law, and personal information protection law, I think the first step is to understand where these laws come from and what they aim for. So you can see here a poster uh, in the middle. It says, um, This is what Xi Jinping said, and it means um, without cybersecurity, there is no national security. So um, actually, cybersecurity, this topic, has been in China for some while, but it has not been the focus. Uh, in China, actually, um, parts of the cybersecurity law, parts like the multi-level protection scheme, I guess you all heard of it before, um, actually exist since um, the 1990s, but they have never been um, mandatory from a legal perspective. They have never been mentioned in a law. So actually, the cybersecurity law, um, which came into force in 2017, was a kickoff of a huge amount of um, legislation and um, uh, it's confirmed for the first time um, as a law that the multi-level protection scheme is mandatory for companies in China. So um, the cybersecurity law and the data security law as well as the personal information protection law might sound similar to some um, legislation that we already know here in the West. Um, so what I want to emphasize once again is um, you need to know where it comes from. And um, in China, these laws come from a um, national security perspective. So the aim of all these laws is to make China secure. Um, and this is the priority one, of course. Um, if you talk about personal information protection, it is also meant to protect the privacy and um, the subject of data, but um, always before the background of national security. So this is why when interpreting these laws and when thinking about um, how these laws might be enforced and how you have to um, implement these laws, always keep in mind that the background is the national security and not necessarily um, the same understanding that we have of similar laws existing here in the West. This is the first important um, point. Then um, we have these three laws, um, first of them cybersecurity law coming into force in 2017, and then last year the two laws, data security law and personal information protection law. And um, these laws are sort of superficial, so the regulations you find in them, they are, most of them are not clear enough to really make you understand how you have to implement them. And they are also not clear enough for anybody to really um, enforce them. So, of course, if you are new to the topic, it absolutely makes sense to first understand the laws, read laws. But then if you want to really understand what you have to do, there are a lot of other documents you will need to refer to to really understand what the details of the legal requirements are. So, as an example, I listed some of these um, further documents down below here. It's the um, white uh, boxes you can see, but this is only a selection. So, this is uh, really only a very small selection of the 
uh, further documents that you will have to refer to when you really want to understand what to do. Um, they come from different authorities. Actually, this also makes this whole um, cybersecurity and data security thing even more complicated because there are several authorities involved in China. Um, one is the Cyberspace Administration China, one is the um, MIIT, and then there's also the Public Security Bureau, uh, which is mainly um, authorized to enforce these laws. And also you have um, standardization uh, committees um, issuing standards related to these laws. Some of them being mandatory, some of them being voluntary. However, even the voluntary standards are um, really important as a reference how to implement um, these laws. Also, one important point that I want to make here in this slide is um, when you're trying to stay updated on the new regulations that are still um, being issued uh, related to these laws, then um, be considerate and don't overpace it. Because uh, in China, in general, before laws um, or before these documents, sort of documents comes into force, there is a draft for comments and not all documents that have been in the uh, state of um, asking for comments will ever come into force. So you see here there's the measures for security assessment of personal information and important data cross-border transfer in 2017, a draft for comment which until now has not come into force. So when there is a new draft like this, of course, it makes sense to look at it and yeah, see what uh, implications it might have for you. But um, you should never start implementing it before it really comes into force because you never know it might never come into force. The reason for this is also once again being that there are several, several authorities involved in um, issuing documents like this. So some of these documents might um, give you a contrary um, opinion or contrary advice how to handle something. So in the end, only one of these uh, contrary documents can actually come into force. Uh, one, as I think, um, of the most important uh, important uh, documents related especially to cybersecurity law are the standards. Um, as there are a lot of standards giving really detailed explanations how to implement the multi-level protection scheme. But I will talk in detail about the different laws um, on the slides later on. Um, just one short notice, um, you see I also listed here the encryption law and the export control law. Um, they won't be our main topic today and I will not um, tell a lot about them. I just mentioned them here because they also um, have a connection to cybersecurity and also to, to personal information protection and data security. Uh, the encryption law mainly regulates encryption, as you uh, probably know. And um, as encryption tools are one of the tools which are very important for cybersecurity, um, it is, of course, important um, to understand the regulations about encryption tools, encryption products, and so on. Um, also, the export control law mentions um, data security and personal information protection. Um, it regulates data export, but this is not our main topic today. And um, also, uh, as data export is also um, mentioned in the data security law, as well as personal information protection law, um, the export control law is just one more thing that you can look um, or that you should know that it exists when exporting data. So uh, let me start with the cybersecurity law. What are the main elements of the cybersecurity law? We have three main elements. The first actually being personal information protection. Um, this is interesting because uh, the cybersecurity law already contains the foundations, the basis for the data security law as well as this personal information protection law. But it contains them in a very superficial way. It actually mainly contains sort of principles um, related to um, personal information processing. 
and collecting, of course. For example, uh, things like um, that your processing needs to be transparent, that there must be a purpose limitation, um, that you can only collect the data that you really need, data minimis minimization, uh, and so on. So these principles all sound very familiar, and um, yeah, we actually also know them from GDPR. But I, I, um, yeah, I will. In, emphasize this also later on, um, there are always differences between the GDPR and the personal information protection re regulations in China. So never um, think that you can just transfer your GDPR compliance system to China and everything will be all right. This is not the case. So, and then there is the second main part of the cybersecurity law, which is protection of critical information infrastructure. Um, we call um, um, the operators of critical information infrastructure, CIOs in short. Um, so I guess that most of you listening to this webinar are not CIOs. Uh, nonetheless, um, you should not just decide not to look at the requirements for CIOs because as soon as a CIO is your client, some of these requirements might nonetheless become relevant for you. Um, of course, there are different requirements for CIOs. Here I um, uh, mentioned the certification for network equipment and cybersecurity products because this might be the um, part which is interesting for you. If you are um, providing uh, network equipment and cybersecurity products, um, then certain certifications um, are necessary so that CIOs are allowed to use them. I listed some of them here below, um, for example, IT product security certification or um, computer information system security special product license. I know the names are all very long and complicated. These certifications are also, um, especially as some of them are actually in theory um, mandatory but are not enforced right now. So um, we expect to see some change in this regard during the next years. And it's definitely something to keep an eye on uh, if you are in active in the area of um, network equipment, actually. But the main part of this cybersecurity law, this is which is important for all companies um, operating in China, having a subsidiary in China, is um, the security requirements for network operator. Um, network operators are basically everyone operating a company which has IT systems. And this already starts with a simple WeChat business account, for example. So um, the question if the multi-level protection scheme is relevant for you or not um, is very easily answered. If you really have a company in China um, which has a computer, um, then you need to say, need to check if there are any obligations um, regarding the multi-level protection scheme for you. Here on the upper right-hand side, you can see a flow chart uh, showing the process of multi-level protection scheme. To the left-hand side, um, you can see the um, standards related to this. They are really important and give a lot of information how to do it. So the basic process is that you need to grade your IT systems. Uh, you need first to, to assess which IT systems you have, and then you have to um, make an assessment which security level they should be graded into. And um, normally for our clients, our experience is that like normal companies um, are have IT systems from level one to level three. Um, for us, most important, or for you also most important, are systems with level two or level three, because level one is voluntary. You don't need to do the MLPS. Um, level four has very high requirements, and level five is state level authorities, whatever. Um, you won't have an IT system that is graded as level five. Um, already for level two and three, um, there are respectively 200 and 310 requirements. So the higher the level, the more the security uh, requirements. And um, just to make it clear, um, it is not up to you to decide 
uh, which level your system is in. Um, of course, you do the assessment or we help you to do the assessment, but in the end you need some external experts to confirm um, that your grading of the IT system has been done correctly. And yeah, of course it's desirable to uh, have a low level um, as the requirements then are mm, less harsh. Um, when you know the level of your IT system, um, you have to register um, the security level with the Public Security Bureau and then um, to make an audit to get a gap analysis to check um, if you are uh, in compliance with the security requirements for the respective level. You can be sure that there will be gaps detected. Uh, we never had a client without a gap. So this is pretty normal. Also, it's quite a lot of gaps normally, but not all of them are really time or money intensive to fix, but they are also quite uh, yeah, intensive uh, gaps to fix normally. Uh, so some of them might be some documents need to be adjusted or drafted, um, but others might be that you need to buy new hardware, new, new products and so on. So you have your gap analysis and then need to adjust your security measures. And after you did that, there will be another audit checking if you fulfilled enough of the requirements. Actually, you don't need to be 100% compliant. Normally, uh, if you reach something between 70 and 80%, it's fine. And then you will get a final report, which also um, will need to be reported to the authorities. And um, yeah, this is not something that you do once, but you will need to do regularly. If you are level three, there's a requirement um, to do it regularly. If you are level two, there's just a requirement um, yeah, to internally um, um, regularly check it if necessary. So let's head on to the personal information protection law. And the personal information protection law um, we have subdivided it into four main areas relevant for you. So the first one is data processing. There are some processing rules, once again, very similar to GDPR. And um, yeah, I mean, it's clear that um, this law, one of the references uh, for this law has been the GDPR. However, also here, there are some differences um, and some similarities, you can see here, um, the duty to inform is something that we already know from here. There are regulations regarding to storage duration and so on. Um, but there are differences. So once again, just putting your GDPR system into your company in China is not enough. You will um, need to make adjust adjustments. So the second uh, important part and one of the parts that's most interesting um, and at the same time, most unclear for now um, is uh, the cross-border data transfer. So if companies in China want to transfer personal information, personal data outside of China, um, there are some um, extended security measures which need to be done. Um, actually, this um, requirements only um, are only relevant if you are surpassing a certain amount of data but as this certain amount has not been stated very clearly um, it is yeah it is for now uh, hard to say um, when you will um, need to take some extra measures also the extra measures um, there are three of them the Cyberspace Administration China Security Assessment, the Data Protection Certification, and the Standard Contractual Clauses. So it looks like you can choose from three different um, measures that you can take, but actually depending on what sort of data transfer, cross-border data transfer you're planning, um, you will have to um, yeah, choose one of these. For example, if you want to transfer data from your Chinese subsidiary um, internally to your headquarter, for example, in France, I don't know, um, then um, the suggested measure is standard contractual clauses. However, for all three of these measures, there are no clear regulations how to, um, how to do them. For example, there are no templates for standard contractual clauses so far, 
um, the process of data prediction certification is not clear at the moment. And also the cyberspace administration of China, China has not started the security assessment. So um, this is something that you will definitely have to keep an eye on. Um, for now, yeah, you can just keep an eye on because it's hard to do anything right now. But you should be aware that transferring data um, outside of China might be restricted in the future and that you will might that you will need to take measures to be allowed to transfer the data in the future. Um, the third main topic is protection of the data subject. So there are data subject rights. We also know this from here, but once again, there are differences. So there are several rights which are not listed in the GDPR. So um, make sure you know of them and make sure um, that you are prepared um, to follow these rights or to, to follow if, if one of the data subjects um, requests information um, and so on. And the fourth part, um, which is actually something that you can already do and should do, um, obligations of the data processor. So I just took an example, the personal information security impact assessment. Of course, there are more obligations like of course, you have to keep the data secure. You um, should not tamper with it. Uh, it should not be leaked. You have to delete it after a certain um, time period. You should collect it on a um, legal way. So just, for example, scrapping websites for information, using it without the data subject's um, consent uh, is, is also not allowed. But um, yeah, something that you can already do is the personal information security impact assessment, the PI, PCR, as we call it. What you need to do first, if you haven't already, is uh, a sort of data mapping so that you know where you collect money, uh, money, uh -huh. where you collect data, um, uh, how you store it, uh, what security measures are in place, and so on. Um, so you need to get an overview over the data that you are processing. And then you need to uh, think about the risks that are related to this processing. Um, so might there be any impacts on personal rights and interests? Or are the effectiveness, uh, is, are the security measures that you already have in place effective or not? Um, so if there is an impact um, on, or there might be an impact on personal rights and interests. And if you see that your security measures are not uh, enough uh, effective, then you will of course have to make adjustments, implement new security measures, and also implement a risk management system. And as always with uh, systems, you have to continuously improve it and uh, yeah, and um, regularly assess if um, your risk identification is still right or if you need to update it. So uh, let's come to the third of these three laws, the data security law. I think the data security law is probably the law which is most hardest to understand for Western people as so far, well, we are also working on things like that, but uh, yeah, they are, they are a little bit different uh, from data security law. So um, there are three main parts, the first being data security and use of data. So despite um, our fears of data, uh, of China restricting any data transfers at all, um, China itself states in this law that um, they won't, um, develop through controlled and secure use of the data and that they are promoting um, data trading. Um, so for example, China already has <clears throat> data ex exchanges in several cities, for example, Shanghai and Beijing. And um, for example, the data exchange in Beijing is also stating that they want to become a, um, the most important international center for data trading in the future. So it, at least for now, it doesn't look like China is definitely planning on keeping other countries out of uh, its data, but this has to be has to be seen. Um, also, in the 14th five-year plan, um, China emphasized the promotion of digitization. So 
the data security law is not only meant to restrict um, the processing of data, but to get it in a structured um, way, to control it in some way, and to prevent uncontrolled <laughs> data trading and data use. So that's also why there's the second block, the data security management. Um, this includes cross-border data transfer management. And um, other than the personal information protection law, what the data security law regulates is not only personal information, um, but also data which is not personal information, so general data, uh, not related to any person. And there they um, draw up three different categories, one being the common data, um, which is actually largely unregulated. Unre and then there is the important data, which is most important for Western companies, because important data is data um, related to national security from a Chinese perspective. And on this sort of data, there are restrictions on transfer and quite strict protection regulations. Um, unfortunately, until today, it is in many sectors of the industry not very clear what important data actually is. Um, we have seen regulations uh, in the automotive um, sector um, about what important data is, but for many other sectors, there's still no very clear um, definition of important data. However, uh, important data is anything that got to do with national security. So starting from huge amounts of personal information, this might also be, um, for example, um, research data on certain topics, um, or uh, geographic data, and so on. So um, I advise you to keep an eye on the definitions of important data. And also when you do a data mapping for your Chinese subsidiaries, um, keep in mind that important data is an issue. And while doing data mapping, you can also do this for not personal data, um, also for data not related to persons, so that when there come stricter um, protection regulations for important data, you are prepared and already know which sort of data you are actually collecting. And then there's core data. I'm not going to um, talk more about this because core data is related to state secrets. And I hope for you that none of you has contact to any Chinese uh, state secrets, actually. So the third um, part of the data security law is the classified and graded data protection system. Um, it is um, basing on the three data categories that I have already mentioned, common data, important data, and core data. The basis of classified and graded data protection um, is the MLPS. The MLPS is the foundation of all IT security and data protection, personal information protection in China. And on top of that, um, the data security law wants that you categorize and grade your data. So um, if you categorize it, there are, for example, four levels, one being data which does not have a very high security requirement because if it's leaked or if it's lost, um, there will not be a big impact. Um, Level three, for example, is important data. Level four is national core data. So you will have to categorize your data um, according to certain groups. Make it, it should make sense how you categorize them. And then you have to grade these groups into these different um, levels so that you can then um, have specific security measures for specific um, data in certain categories with a certain grading. Um, so all of this is just aiming to have very um, transparent protection systems and also consistent um, protection systems of all data um, that you are processing. So um, this is already my last slide. And um, this is also uh, an important slide because what this webinar is about is what you need to know for now. Um, so the basis of all these three laws and compliance with these three laws is actually the multi-level protection scheme. So if you have any IT systems in China, 
first thing that you need to do is check if you need to go implement the multi-level protection scheme or not. Um, here on the right hand side, you see um, different sorts of companies that I've listed. Um, on the top, it's critical information infrastructure operators. As I said, probably none of you is one of uh, is a CIO, but your clients might be. Also, companies related to national security, e-commerce companies, um, or companies whose main business is data processing. I listed them separately because, uh, of course, for these companies, um, personal information protection is the um, is also very important. Um, mechanical engineering companies, manufacturers in China, and sales offices. So the multi-level protection scheme is important for each and everybody of these companies. Um, maybe if you are a sales office, depending on how many clients you have, um, your IT systems might only be level one. But nonetheless, even if you're yourself are pretty sure that your systems are all level one, you need to do the multi-level protection scheme assessment first, assess the IT systems and um, document if your result is that you are only uh, level one. Network security equipment is actually also important for all companies that need to do multi-level protection scheme because depending on the level that your IT systems are in, um, you also have certain requirements related to the network security equipment that you are using. So for network security equipment, there are some certifications, as I mentioned before. And for example, for systems level three, um, your network security equipment needs a certification so that it um, so that you can pass the multi-level protection scheme. Um, so after you have done the multi-level protection scheme, the next step is personal information protection. Unless you are an e-commerce company, maybe you are even an e-commerce company not even having um, uh, office in China, then of course the multi-level protection scheme is irrelevant for you and you can directly start with personal information protection. The higher the number of personal information that you are processing, um, the faster you should uh, follow the regulations of the personal information protection. Um, also, data cross-border transfer is a topic that's relevant for most of you, I guess, um, unless you really do not transfer any data abroad. Um, so many clients of us, especially manufacturers and so on, um, they think, okay, we, we, of course, we have some personal information protection, especially of employees and clients and so on, but it's not that much, so there shouldn't be a problem transferring it to Europe. Mm, but that's not so easy, actually. So um, please start doing data mapping, get an overview of what data you process, what amount of data especially you process, um, how it is collected and um, how long it is stored and so on, so that all of your processing activities are actual, actually legitimate and um, not unlegal. Um, and the data security law is for now the law that's the least important for you now. I would suggest if you do data mapping, um, directly do data mapping, not only for personal information, but for all data that is processed in your company. This is actually a little bit hard because coming from, from GDPR background, most employees here are aware that there are special regulations for personal information protection and that they need to be careful with that. And they also need to uh, know where they um, collect personal information and how they process it. But they are not aware of general data, which is not personal information. Um, so doing data mapping on all data is actually a little bit hard because there is no awareness for other data in many companies so far. But still, if you're doing data mapping, we strongly suggest to do it for all data um, because if you don't do it for all data, just do it for personal information protection, you will have to do it twice. Um, protection of important data is, of course, at the moment most relevant for CIOs and companies related to national security. But once again, the point, if your clients is client is a CIO, 
then some of these requirements might be relevant for you too and you might fulfill some um, need to fulfill some uh, uh, requirements to keep your CIO client. So to make it short, um, if you have any sort of IT in China, um, start with the multi-level protection scheme. This is the most uh, uh, the best way to start this. If you don't have IT, then um, personal information protection law is the first thing to look at. Um, and if you have clients that are CIOs, you should also get familiar with the data uh, security law. However, if your clients are CIO, I would just suggest to first talk to them about like, what they expect of you and they will probably be able uh, to tell you what to do. So I hope this webinar was uh, helpful for you. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me anytime. You can see my contact data here um, and we will be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you.